Greetings and a baragani. It's Kwanzaa time. I'm Dr. Clyde Robertson, director for the Center for African and African American Studies at Southern University at New Orleans. Welcome to our virtual Kwanzaa presentation for 2020. Our featured speaker is Dr. Ron Daniels, who will discuss the all important topic of reparations a concept whose time has come. Dr. Daniels is a veteran social and political activist who ran for president of the United States of America in 1992. He also served as executive director of the National Rainbow Coalition in 1987, and in 1988, he coordinated Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign. Dr. Daniels is a distinguished lecturer emeritus at York College, City University of New York, where he taught courses in political studies. In June of 1995, Dr. Daniels led an African-American fact-finding mission to Haiti. As a result of that mission, the Haitian Support Project was created in order to mobilize ongoing political and material support for the struggle of democracy and development in Haiti. Dr. Daniels is the founder and president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, a progressive African-centered action-oriented resource center dedicated to empowering people of African descent and marginalized communities. As the administrator for the National African American Reparations Commission, the IBW has emerged as a leading organization within the United States and global reparations movements. NARC has developed a 10-point reparations program and is a staunch supporter of H.R. 40, the congressional bill that would establish a national commission to study reparations proposals for African Americans. Again, our presenter, Dr. Ron Daniels, pursuing the topic, reparations, a concept whose time has come. I'm Dr. Ron Daniels, president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century and uh, convener of the National African American Reparations Commission. And I am profoundly thankful and honored uh, to have been asked by Dr. Clyde Robinson, director of the Center for African and African American Studies at Southern University, New Orleans, uh, to provide uh, some words of knowledge, hopefully encouragement uh, on this occasion of Kwanzaa. <clears throat> uh, the topic he's asked me to speak to is from Black Power to Black Lives Matter, reparations is a concept whose time has come. And indeed, it is a concept whose time has come. Well, first, let's get some acknowledgments out of the way. Um, not only do I want to thank Dr. Clyde Robinson, I have to thank his taskmaster, Ms. Darlene Holmes, because she is a taskmaster. She makes sure that everything gets done and that it gets done on time. So I just want to give her a shout out. <clears throat> I also want to give profound thank, uh, appreciation for the incredible support uh, that NARC received from for its town hall meeting. Some of you will recall the incredible town hall meeting we had a couple of years ago in New Orleans. 
And of course, uh, Dr. Clyde Robinson and his staff were incredibly supportive as we came into the town to talk about our 10 point program and HR 40. Big shout out to Emtimisi St. Julia, my longtime friend. Uh, the local chapter of the National Association of Black Social Workers, Larry Hayes, has always been uh, willing to help whenever we've come in to do the work. Our sister Sarisi from over at Xavier University, what a partnership that was between these two institutions. The Ashe Cultural Center, what can I say? The Ashe, Ashe Cultural, uh, Cultural Center, founded by Doug Red, uh, of course, his beautiful uh, and visionary, courageous partner, Carol Bebel. They are just a fabulous uh, center there in New Orleans and an incredible base for organizing and cultural development. It has just become so powerful. And, and they hosted us. They were so gracious and so kind to give us a big lift. Our planning meetings were there. Also, uh, not, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Charles Perkins. That's right, the Chuckster on the Chuck Wagon. We were getting a hell of a lot of support from WBOK, including from Oliver Thomas. Uh, and, and, yeah, and Oliver Thomas as well, and our general manager, forgive me for not remembering her name, uh, but they gave us, I mean, it was on fire because WBAOK was talking about reparations, reparations, reparations for weeks. And we had a massive turnout uh, over a three-day period there uh, in New Orleans. And also the Republic of New Africa. You know, we were trying to raise some funds. I remember a brother, don't know his name, he came up and put $1,000 on the table and said, let's get it on. We shouldn't be worried about how to move this forward. And of course, the local and Cobra chapter, um, also my friends uh, over at the uh, People's Institute, uh, certainly Larry, uh, Al, Al Colon, uh, who was uh, part of the planning committee there. Uh, and of course, uh, our dear beloved friend, Dr. V. P. Franklin, who is a commissioner on the National African American Reparations Commission. <laughs> it was an awesome su success. <clears throat> and by the way, you can still see that town hall meeting on the IBW website at IBW21.org. We have the most extensive online reparations resource center in the world. <clears throat> Let me say that again. The most extensive online reparations resource center in the world, put together by none other than Don Rojas. Uh, Don Rojas, of course, the former press secretary for the People's Revolutionary Government of, of Grenada under the late Maurice Bishop. So go to that website and check it out. I would be remiss in my responsibility also if I did not say, call out, uh, Dr. Maialana Karinga. Dr. Maialana Karinga, his brilliance, his genius. We are now celebrating the 55th anniversary of the Nguzu Saba, 55 years since this brother, this genius, this visionary presented to us the Nguzu Saba and all of its magnificent based on the con concept of Kawaida, the doctrine of tradition and reason, which we should not overlook in terms of what it means. It says we are African centered. We believe in the African worldview. We must return to the source, as Gabral would say, to reclaim ourselves within the middle of a Eurocentric value system that is always aggressively attacking us, if you will, and our people. And, and but, but the foundation is to look back, to build on African culture, not in terms of all the specificity of it, but to extract the principles of it and to apply them in the modern context. Brilliantly conceived by Dr. Maialana Karinga, Kawaida, the doctrine of tradition, but also reason. And also, you know, we have to remember in these difficult times as we continue as African people to grow and develop, it was Karinga who said the key, the key challenge in black life is the cultural crisis the cultural crisis, unless we can reclaim who we are and to know who we are and to build in a way that has us understand that the white man's ice is not always cold, colder. In fact, it is never colder than black ice, actually. He said, we will never ever develop to the extent we that we need to. And so we need to keep and honor Dr. Maialana Karinga for and his incredible contributions that he has, that he has made. Now, reparations is indeed a concept whose idea has, uh, a, a, whose time has come as an idea and a concept. I mean, if we just want to trace a little history quickly, and all of you know this, most of the audience does, but, but for those who don't, we're going to do a quick mini history. 
was Mal, uh, Malcolm X, Al Haj, Malik, El Shabazz, who said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. And what he meant by what that was, we didn't come here voluntarily. We were snatched out of Africa, right? I mean, we were snatched. Not only were we snatched out of Africa, it is, it is important to understand that we were and have been the great givers of life and civilization. So we were not some, <clears throat> some savages, some uncivilized people. It was the uncivilized ones who came to rip us out of Africa in the face of the great Sudanic kingdoms, all of the, le the, the history of having given the world its great civilizing, in, uh, civilizing influences, our history was interrupted. Our development was under, un, interrupted by people who were not as developed as we were. And this is not a chauvinistic statement. This is a statement of historical fact. Not only that, it is really the black wealth. It is enslaved labor, enslaved labor. There was no notion, notion by the way, of our being, uh, being inferior. They knew better. It was not about our inferiority. The whole notion of you know in the of of, of racist in racial racial inferiority is developed somewhat later to rationalize the horrific <coughs> Holocaust of enslavement, the greatest Holocaust in human history. But indeed, it is enslaved African labor that built Europe and America. Of course, the classics on this are Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Manning Marables, How Capitalism Underdeveloped. Uh, underdeveloped, or how Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, uh, Marable, how capitalism underdeveloped uh, uh, Black America, and of course, Claude Anderson's classic Black labor, white wealth. In this country, after the trial of uh, enslavement, after having landed here some 400 years ago, eventually there was a quote unquote emancipation an emancipation which we fought for. Our people really compelled, I have not the time to go through how we were liberating ourselves, <clears throat> the insurrections, the never ever being willing to, to, to accept uh, domination by the European uh, enslavers, if you will. But there came a time when there was a so-called emancipation. It was really only a par partial emancipation. And so in 1863, you know, Abraham Lincoln, for political reasons and economic reason, he emancipated some of the Africans who were enslaved. Uh, he didn't really, that was never really not completed until the 13th Amendment, um, a couple of, about two or three years later. And of course, uh, it took a while for some Africans to even get that news, hence the whole celebration of Juneteenth. But the major point is this. We were emancipated and we had political rights. We had more political power doing what Du Bois called black reconstruction than at any other time than the present. We had governors, we had senators, we had, uh, we had Congress people, we had sheriffs, we had a lot of political power because of this marriage with the radical wing of the Republican party of that time. What we did not have, however, was economic power. We were not given an endowment in this capitalist political economy that was built on our free labor. We did not get the 40 acres and a mule, even though a few, uh, uh, General Sherman and his field order had talked about the idea of 40 acres and a mule stretching all the way from uh, South Carolina all the way to Florida, if you will. And indeed, the Reconstruction Legislature actually did pass a bill on reparations, which was vetoed by President Andrew Johnson, which says they understood the value and the significance and the fact that we should have been paid. We should have been given an endowment, but we were not. So therefore, we were reduced to having been involved in a whole new, a new system of slavery, the convict lease, lease system. 3.5 million people in the, in the South, you know, who become uh, sharecroppers agricultural laborers, tenant farmers, really working on a new plantation system. Many of us went back to the same plantations we were supposedly emancipated from. And then they criminalized us, drove us in. That's why the can convict lease system developed. I mean, if, if you just, if, if the people were just gathering, loitering so supposedly, you were criminalized. 
so they all so so again the whole question of the so-called criminal injustice system ever since we've been on these hostile shores again perpetuating itself and so that is a fundamental fact that we have to deal with after post reconstruction even the political power evaporated in an era of unprecedented racial violence and terror which included lynchings thousands of black people who were lynched in these united states of america and so reparations are are due have been due and reparations are simply in its most rudimentary sense rudimentary sense the repair of the physical cultural mental or spiritual damages inflicted upon a people there's a process that you go through in terms of uh, how it ought to ultimately unfold and the organization in cobra has done an excellent job in a, in a primer on hr 40 uh, laying out what some of those ideas are you know and it, it involves uh, a secession and, and guarantees of non-repetition restitution compensation satisfaction rehabilitation all of these are ideas before we get to anything looking like something called reconciliation it is a process through which we should go Reparations is also about our identity, about our identity. Malcolm X also said, of all the crimes committed by, by Europeans against Africans, the greatest crime was to take our names. What he meant by that was, I mean, why am I Ron Daniels, right? You know, I mean, many of us changed our names and so forth, but I don't really know my authentic African name. I've, I've actually done my, you know, my, uh, my genetic analysis and so forth. And I know I am, uh, I'm a, a Yoruba with some, you know, some house, uh, not house or some Fulani and so forth. And I've done that, but I don't know the name because that name was taken away. Cultural aggression, breaking up the sense of cultural continuity. Our identity matters. Our bodies matter, our spirits matter, our mentality matter, and trauma that has been passed on intergenerationally still suffering from that today. And so reparations are due for all of that. Now reparations is not only is for enslavement, but we also want to let, because a lot of people get thinking that we're just talking about enslavement, even our people. So the education of our people becomes incredibly important because it's not just for enslavement. It is for the greatest crime committed in human history, the Holocaust of enslavement and the dehumanization of black people, reducing us to property to the point that we had a peculiar, a set of laws called chattel law to regulate this, this, this kind of property. Only in these United States of America were Africans reduced to property. That does not mean that slavery was not brutal in other places. We're not saying that. We're saying conceptually, in terms of the law, we were reduced to property. And many other African nations, I mean, not many other places, families were kept together, even though the brutality was there, the ruthlessness was there. But in this country, you was like, you were like, as, as Malcolm said, a cow, a chicken, or a horse. You were property. And so therefore, we could be disposed of in, in whatever way uh, our, our, our so-called slave masters chose to do. But it was about more than that. Let us recall that it was our free labor that built this capitalist political economy. There's no question about that. Uh, again, I cited the, the two previous references, but the Homestead Act is one of the occasions of, of racially exclusionary policies. Freed, no 40 acres in a mule, but the Homestead Act comes. White folks can take get, get the Homestead Act. We are excluded on the basis of our, our, our skin color. Uh, the railroads, multinational corporations, they can get a stake of that land in the West moving less. Black folks could, could not get that. In fact, we were held in the South deliberately and, and intentionally by the forces of capitalism in the North in collusion with the South as they brought literally 13, 14, 15 million immigrants from Europe to work in the factories, the foundries and, and the mines in the Northern part of the country. They too were ruthlessly exploited, but it was much better to have a wage and a factory, a mine uh, or, 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 or a, a plant than to be a sharecropper where every time you brought your, you ended the, the year, it never added up that you benefited. As a tenant farmer, the same thing, or as an agricultural laborer. Parenthetically, just it is interesting though, that despite that, 
Despite that, black folks still fought and owned millions of acres of land, built independent towns, showed a tremendous resiliency in spite of all this oppression. But nonetheless, it was indeed oppression, violently uh, being forced into a system of Southern apartheid enforced by the law. The, uh, you know, the second world, and by the way, since we fought in every war, America's most patient patriots can't say, you know, we ain't been loyal. That's why Kwame Chwe once said, you know, Christmas addicts must have been out of his mind. The first to die in the American Revolution, fought in the American Revolution. Oh, you know, fought in the, in the, in the Civil War. Martin Delaney changed his mind, getting ready to leave up out of here, decide let's, let's stay up in here. Let's, let's fight for our own freedom, delivered on it. And for a brief moment, we thought we had an opportunity. But of course, then came, you know, the, 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 the abandonment of black people by the same Republican Party that we had supported. Uh, and, and, and of course, the withdrawal of the federal troops and then the reign of terror that I talked about earlier. And so we go marching off to war over and over again. First World War, bloody red sun, summer. I mean, Tulsa. Elaine, there are city after city where we are massacred, gunned down in the streets in our uniforms. As uh, the coach of the, uh, the, the former coach of the Clippers once said, he said, we keep loving America, but America just won't love us back. So we've invested. Nobody can talk to us about a flag. Nobody can talk about kneeling for the anthem. We have paid the price, never been paid for the work that we've already put in. Second World War, GI Bill, GI Bill for white folks, no GI Bill for black folks. Uh, FHA, the Finance Federal Fi Housing Authority, built the suburbs and gave white people an endowment and a stake after the Second World War. We were excluded from that. In fact, and then the Agricultural Extension Act in the South, even under FDR, it was kind of, you know, well, these, these, these programs, you do that stuff up north, don't do it down south. So our farmers, deny the same rights as white farmers uh, were able to achieve. Redlining, by now everybody knows about redlining, how redlining in fact displaced even thriving black communities. Displacement violently, but also through the laws and schemes like urban renewal. We called urban renewal the Negro removal program in the 20th century. Now it's gentrification redlining, the disinvestment of black people in, in black communities, starving them of their wealth, therefore perpetuating this, this, this huge wealth gap, this huge wealth gap between blacks and whites in this society that we have never bridged, no matter how prosperous we look on the outside, no matter how many millionaires and, and, and 100,000 years and all that, our wealth, our net assets, compared to white people are abysmally low and has not really moved in decades. Gentrification and yes, the drug war, the targeting. So reparations is about racially exclusionary policies that have targeted black people, people of African descent in these United States of America. And the struggle for reparations has been a long struggle. We've never ever relented didn't relent during the course of slavery itself, rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. Whether it was Nat Turner or Denmark Vesey, who's about to get up out of here, the most elaborate slave uh, insurrection plan. Of course, unfortunately, there are always, you know, as Malcolm said, folk who are willing to go and just tell Master what's up. But he was on his way to a free nation called IET because IAT was, was the, the only example in human history of an enslaved people rising up against their slave master to achieve independence and to establish an independent nation. Of course, crushed for that reason, because they shattered the myth of white supremacy. Yet, it resonated in the minds of the people that there was a place that black people could potentially go. So that struggle rate, that struggle has been long. And we have a document called a, a 10 point program, which I'll re refer to uh, in, in a minute. Uh, but in that 10 point program, we just cite some of the developments historically. I'm just going to run through them real, real quickly, some of which I've already noted. General Sherman's uh, Field Order 15 and the promises of 40 acres and a mule, the National 
uh, enslave, enslavement, mutual relief, bounty, and pension association led by Sister Callie House. Uh, the work of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore, my mentor, you know, who uh, had the Committee for Descendants of United, United Slaves Incorporated, the Republic of New, of New Africa, and the RNA under Dr. Imari, Imari Obadeli, James Foreman, remember him going to Riverside Church demanding uh, reparations with the, uh, the Black Manifesto. Uh, the National Coalition for, for Reparations of Blacks in America and COBRA playing a leading role in the last half century. Uh, Black activists like Reparations uh, Ray Jenkins, an unknown person in Detroit, he was the one who persuaded John Kinders to introduce H.R. 40. John Kinders himself, State Senator Bill Owens, a name that a lot of people don't know about in Massachusetts, who introduced the very first bill in a uh, state legislature demanding reparations. And of course, El Haj Malik, El Shabazz, Malcolm X, the National Black United Front, and the National Black, uh, the National Black United Front of the December 12th movement, which mobilized around the Durban Conference. So there is a long history of resistance, of demanding reparations. And of course, just again, reiterating Cowley House, Queen Mother Moore. Uh, I can remember being at the Gary Convention in 1972. She's in the lobby saying, you got to get your reparations. You got to get your reparations. You got to fight for your reparations. And of course, at that time, we were looking at her like she was crazy. We're not looking like her like she was crazy anymore because Black people increasingly have come to understand that the only way to overcome white supremacy and structural institutional racism in this country is through reparations. Again, I've talked about in COBRA, the role they played in COBRA, invaluable role. Imari Obadeli with the Republic of New Africa. And of course, just giving a shout out to Reparations Ray. Reparations Ray was the one who went to Conyers, one of the most progressive congressmen of all time. And he said to, uh, to John Conyers, he said, Congressman Conyers, we got to get our reparations. He eventually succeeded, uh, conceded to do so. And so Conyers in 1989, introduced H.R. 40. H.R. 40 was a study bill, and I emphasize study bill, a bill to study whether the, 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 the harms of enslavement warranted reparations, you know, because it wasn't even about giving, rep, granting reparations. And we in the movement, including in COBRA and other organizations, latched onto it as an organizing tool. Because you got to remember, even many black people said, ah, oh, I mean, and yeah, we made, but that, that's never going to happen. That's like, you know, it's like having a black president. I mean, you really believe that can happen in these United States of America? I mean, that was kind of the way people were looking at it. And so it was an educational and organizing tool. It was also an education and organizing tool for white, white allies to get them to look at it, to see whether or not they said, oh, can, can we at least just study it? Massive organizing went into H.R. 40. Year after year after year, Congressman Conyers introduced H.R. 40 uh, as a study bill, really mapped, though modeled after the Japanese reparations bill that actually had passed the Congress of the United States and signed by the president to provide that those Japanese who were deterred in concentration camps, Japanese citizens, in these United States of America. So it was, there was a conscious strategy there in terms of putting HR 40 uh, together. And so in the most recent developments, we have to give a shout out to Tanahashi Coates. Now I didn't realize, I mean, who is this Tanahashi Coates guy? Well, now I kind of understand. There's a brother named Paul Coates has black, black classic press, black nationalist, African centered. That's his father. And so I kind of later came to understand where some of that, that, that knowledge came from, that inquisitiveness came from. Tanahashi Coates, who wrote for The Atlantic, he wasn't a believer in reparations. He just decided he would study it. But in studying it in Chicago, looking at Red Line, he became convinced. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. Reparations is an idea whose time has come. And a whole new generation of young people and then even like even white folks, I mean, for a while, I mean, that this was the talk of the, the country, this explosive piece written by Tanahashi Coates. And he has been so principled and not trying to act like he created the reparations movement or that he wants to lead it. He's always been willing to like meet with folks and to 
to to come to our events and and to not sort of see himself as and he gave props to Conyers and others before him and I say that because there's some who have not done uh, likewise so I want to give him a shout out Black Lives Matter exploded onto the scene saying mm, all Black Lives Matter all Black people matter and we have to have reparations and that is translated into the movement for Black Lives that has a reparations agenda as well. And then there is a little known maybe movement, and we, 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 we brought this to New Orleans, but a lot of people still are not clear that in 2014, the 15 nations of the Caribbean came together and audaciously and boldly, as they're, they're still neo-colonial entities, they're still dependent upon the colonial powers, they said, y'all created this mess. We want reparations for native genocide, which is important. We must always remember in the indigenous people, we are in this country, the original sin of the, the dispossession of native people. So we all have benefited from that disposition, the ruthless, brutal dis dispossession. But that took place throughout the Caribbean as well. So they, in a principal way, talked about native genocide and African enslavement. And they created a commission called the, the CARICOM Reparations Commission, and they put together a 10-point reparations program. Well, we in this, this country, in the United States, took a look at that. And a group of us got together and said, maybe that's something we should look for in these United States of America. Maybe that will give an additional boost to the reparations movement. And indeed, that's how the National African American Reparations Commission was born, through a synergistic dynamic relationship between our Caribbean sisters and brothers. Major conferences we had in uh, New York, people came from over 22 nations in the world. Uh, we had an interface with our new commission with the CARICOM commission. Subsequently, we developed a 10-point reparations program to, to serve as a kind of reference point. Because see, there's a danger. We don't want everybody running around saying reparations, 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 when it ain't really reparations. Because right now, it's almost like everybody's talking about reparations. So that 10-point program was designed to be a reference point. And when you go to the website, ibw21.org, and go to that reparations resource center, you will find the 10-point program. And there are certain characteristics I want to point out. One is the notion of a reparations finance authority. The idea that Black people must have its own mechanism for receiving reparations based on a broad-based, legitimized group of activists, organizers, professionals, every spectrum of the Black community to deal with both direct benefits, because everybody's always talking about, well, Black people get a check. And then even Black people say, oh, no, we don't get a need to get a check. Well, no, direct benefits are warranted. Take Tulsa. There's a 100, a woman who's now over 100 years old, one of the survivors. She should be able to get direct benefits but the, the, the reality is the destruction of Greenwood, the destruction of Black Wall Street is greater than the sum of the individual families that made it up. A community was destroyed. So in our 10-point program, we talk, about, we talk about community benefits. How can we talk about land? Malcolm said what land is the basis of independence. How can we talk about hospitals and, and healthcare facilities? How can we talk about communications infrastructure, housing that will accrue to all of our people? And by the way, let me just take this occasion to say this. When we say all of our people, we mean all of our people. We do not, we're not into saying that because we have people who have that Malcolm's sons and daughters or Kamala Harris's sons and daughters or Shirley Chisholm's sons and daughters are not entitled to reparations because they're not quote unquote, American descendants of slavery. This is like lunacy. We are Pan-Africanist. We were all, in one way or another, victimized by slavery and racially exclusionary policies. So when you arrive in New Orleans, if you arrive in Atlanta, if you arrive in Chicago, if you arrive in Jackson, Mississippi, you are arriving in an underdeveloped community because of the legacy of enslavement. And you will, so therefore you will be harmed having already been harmed in Africa, already been harmed in Jamaica, you will already be harmed when you arrive in. So we're not making this, this, this like nativist, this black nativist anti-immigrationist posture. We reject that. And so we talk about community benefits. All people of African descent are entitled to reparations. So where are we now? 
H.R. 40, because of the work of INCOBRA and the National African American Reparations Commission, is no longer the same bill. We went to Congressman Conyers and we said, Congressman Conyers, there have been enough studies. I mean, there have been study after study after study. We need to move to the remedy phase now. And Congressman Conyers, being the great visionary leader that he was, says, I agree. The bill that is now being led by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, H.R. 40, is a bill to study, but it is no longer to study if reparations are warranted. It is a bill to study reparations proposals, reparations proposals for African Americans. That's a remedy bill. And the HR 40, that the original HR 40 never had more than I think 40 sponsors, co-sponsors. It was, and sometimes in like me may have 10 or 15 because of the work of the uh, of organizations, the, the work of NCOBRA, the work of the National African American Reparations Commission, the work of Movement for Black Lives. The, the current bill has almost 170 sponsors, 170. 170, and it's being talked about. H.R. 40, reparations is in the air. Indeed, it is on the verge of being marked up and passed in the, in the House of Representatives. Uh, Cory Booker, presidential candidate, senator from New Jersey, introduced a version in the Senate. That version was signed off on uh, by Kamala Harris as a co-sponsor. Ultimately, it needs to pass both houses in order to become law. There was some anticipation that had the, the election gone as we had hoped it would, we'd be, we'd be already, already ready to look forward to the bill passing in the Senate. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the point is, reparations is like being talked about everywhere. Not only that, are we talking about reparations, reparations at the national level because of the visionary work of a sister named Robin Rue Simmons Reparations has become the law in Evanston, Illinois. $10 million was allocated over 10 years. And we in the National African American Reparations Commission have helped to certify, to help build that reparations program and certify it. So now Providence, Rhode Island, you know, Asheville may be having some difficulties, but they're talking about it. Cities all across the country are talking about reparations initiatives at the local level. People are trying challenging university, challenging corporations. Reparations is being talked about. And the California legislature, under the leadership of uh, State Senator Shirley Weber, the leader of the, the uh, Legislative Black Caucus, recently passed an HR 40 type bill with bipartisan support, it is law in the state of California. Tremendous victory. So reparations is on the march. And again, that's because of the mass movement in the streets in many respects. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has said that reparations is the umbrella. And this is what we should also understand. This ain't about a check. No amount of money can ever repay us for the damages done to our people. Not no amount of money for the trauma that we've endured as a people. And it's not just about even getting some land and some health care and all that. Because at the end of the day, we have to deal with structural institutional racism and white supremacy. And Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has correctly said that HR 40 and the concept of reparations is the umbrella that strikes at the heart of structural institutional racism in this country. And we think that she is correct. So sisters and brothers and friends, and a question of whether reparations is a time who's come, reparation, the concept of reparation has arrived. When we began many, many years ago, when Queen Mother Moore was in the, the hallways of Gary at the high school, maybe 15, 20% of black people even believed in the concept of reparations. Now we're up to about 75, percent of black people saying we're down right with reparations even in the white communities up to 56 percent we are making significant we are winning in terms of the struggle for reparations it has arrived reparations was on the ballot in this last election and really perhaps if it had been talked about a little bit more maybe we would have been successful in capturing the senate but make no mistake about it 
reparations now is on the ballot in Georgia. That's right. Because in order to move this legislation forward in the way we would like, it becomes important that the Senate of the United States be in the hands of the Democrats. Now, let me just say this. Please don't mistake the Democrats, the Republicans, any of that. I mean, we, we are looking for an avenue to advance our interests. It just so happens at this, this, this point, the Democrats offer the best opportunity for advancing our interests. We'll come back and debate some of that, but, but right now that's where we need to be landing. And all roads lead to Georgia, where there are two senators up. If these ten of two senators make it, and they can make it because there are enough black votes in order to take to, to, to elect both of them. R Raphael Warnock is one of them, noted brother. He's a great leader came out of Abyssinian Baptist Church under the tutelage of Reverend Calvin, uh, Calvin Otis Butts at Abyssinian Baptist Church. He's a good brother. Uh, the other person, the other gentleman, I think his name is Allstott or something like that. I may be blanking on it. Seems to have a good progressive record too. Uh, a little bit different in some ways. Don't let the, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. We need two senators. And if that happens, Kamala will be the person who gives the Democrats the majority. We need, therefore, to encourage people in Georgia to march on ballot boxes, to march on ballot boxes. Now, imagine this, sisters and brothers. It's coming down to Georgia, where, 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 where General Sherman, you know, was scorched earth, scorched earth as he went across the country, putting them, you know, breaking up the railroads, and he, he was punishing these Southern segregationists, angry. They, and some of them are still angry. White nationalism was on the ballot as well because we know that the forces uh, behind Agent Orange and the Orange Man are white nationalists. And John Henry Clark said that white nationalism is the enemy of black nationalism. So we are, we are in a contest against white nationalism. So imagine the irony, the, 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 sort, of, the sort of sweet, uh, 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 poetic justice and, and righteousness of the sons and daughters of those who were enslaved in Georgia, a former Confederate state, delivering to the United States Congress two senators. Imagine that, sisters and brothers. And that's why, you know, we got to do everything we can. Get on the phone, you know, get on the, the internet, the, the, the Instagram, the whatever, what maybe. But we didn't have that back in slavery. We only had the drums. We only had the grapevine. Now we have all of these mediums. We have to be marching on ballot boxes because reparations is an idea that has arrived. And for us to push it forward, we're now at a critical crossroads. So those of you who are tuning in to this this, to, this, to this discussion, if you will, all over the country, Louis, both, both, in, both in, in, in Louisiana, but all over the world, because the Center, you know, the Center for African and African American Studies has this vast reach, understand that reparations is on the ballot. And that's a terminology created by Encrover, brilliantly crafted to have people understand what our interest is. It's not about Biden. It ain't even really about the orange man. It's about our interests pragmatically seeking out those avenues to push forward our agenda, if you will. So I say rise up Africans, rise up Africans, rise up people of African descent. In this moment of 55 years since the creation of the Nguzu Saba, it is about Yemoja, right? Yemoja, unity, unity, unity among our people operational unity being one form of it. We may have some disagreements on various things, but we should be able to operationally unite around the idea that we need to push reparations forward because reparations is at a time that it has arrived, right? And we have to just finish the journey. It's about Ujima, collective work and responsibility, working together as sisters and brothers to ensure a victory. It's about Nia having the creativity. I mean, we some creative people. We find ways to get stuff done that people marvel at. So we need that kind of creativity now. How do we get to, how do we create a Harold Washington type mayoral scenario in Georgia 
you know, with the homeless people, the pimps, the prostitutes, the, the, the professionals, the preachers, the teachers. I mean, all of us is black people. Malcolm said at the end of the day, we don't get oppressed because we're homeless or because we're Democrats or Republicans or, or Methodists or whatever. We all get oppressed because we're black people. White nationalism versus black nationalism in its broadest and finest sense. We are, we are committed and should be committed to moving this process forward. And finally, Imani, faith, faith, faith. You know, Martin Luther King, when he was on that uh, concluding his speech, he said, with this faith, you know, we don't always know how it's going to end. We don't know just how to move, but we do know Nia, creativity. We do know that, 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 that there's a power that we can tap, a spirituality that moves in the bones and souls of black folk. Du Bois talked about the souls of black people that we can tap. And so that faith, he said, with this faith, I return to the South. Well, with that same faith, with Imani, faith in our leaders, faith in our teachers, faith in our, in our God, faith in our what, whatever, whatever higher power moves us to do things that seem improbable, to, in, to, to, to enable the phoenix to rise up out of the ashes to achieve great things. We need to be moving to Georgia. Midnight train, plane, whatever you can take to be in support of reparations in Georgia because reparations will be on the ballot. So brothers and sisters, Reparations has arrived and our long sojourn will not be over when HR 40 is passed. It'll just be the beginning of a new phase of struggle because there will be some people who want to just give some pablum. They'll just want to give some Novocaine. They just want to pass out some stuff to pacify. We're not settling for pacification proposals coming from the Congress of the United States. So in some sense, the fight, the, the, the fight will just be beginning to push forward a kind of radical, progressive, visionary, African-centered set of proposals for moving this country, moving our people, healing our people, and moving this, this country, if it were ever possible, towards a more perfect union. That's who we are as a people. And so I close this discussion with a pledge that I wrote, oh God, I don't know how many years ago, let me, let me take a look at the, the 1970. I wrote this pledge to African people. And there's a pledge that talks about who we are and I think is appropriate for this moment. And so I say, we are an African people. We must remember the humanity, glory, and sufferings of our ancestors and honor the struggle of our elders. That's right, honor the struggle of our elders. The African-centered value system, Karinga talking about Kawaita, the doctrine of tradition and reason honoring our elders. We must strive to bring new values and new life to our people. That's what the Nguza Saba was about, giving us a new sense of values and principles and recapturing it. We must have peace and harmony among us. We, 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 we've got to stop. We've got to infuse a sense of purpose to ourselves so we're not turning guns on each other. Now, you know, we may, may need to be defending ourselves. We don't need to be turning on each other. We need to find a way to defend ourselves. We will be loving, sharing, and creative. We will work, study, and listen so we may learn, learn so we may teach. Important because we had some people jumping out here, you know, this one and that one, you know, trying to be helpful, ignorant, in the, in the, not in the negative, because they just didn't know. They don't have the knowledge. Don't ever be jumping out without knowledge. Knowledge is power. So we must work, study, and listen so we may learn, and learn so we must teach. And teaching becomes important because that which we have, our education, is not our education. There are too many people who suffered, bled, and died for us to have this education. And so we must be of the race and for the race. My education is not my education. It's an education bestowed to me by my neighbors in Youngstown, Ohio, people who worked and helped nourish this young brain, this, this reckless person wandering around. I have a duty and obligation to share what I know. I'm not anybody without those on whose shoulders I stand. We must cultivate self-reliance. Got to stop paying for what we want and begging for what we need. 
We must struggle to resurrect and unify our homeland. That's fundamental. Garvey said it, Europe for the Europeans, Asia for the Asians, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. We must raise many children for our nation. We don't mean that we're asking sisters just have a bunch of children. That's not what we're saying. We're saying there must be no motherless children, no fatherless children. We are all in the spirit of the African village. All of the children belong to all of us. In uh, Louisiana, in New Orleans, Ahidiana, the school that was put forth by, that was built by Kalama Yasalam and by Imtimishi Son St. Julian were built on those principles. We must have discipline, patience, devotion, and courage. We will live as models, as models to provide, to provide new directions for our people. We must be free and self-determining because we are an African people. We are the ones who built the pyramids. We're the ones who gave the world mathematics. We gave the world its first multi-genius and the person who built the pyramids and gave the whole notion of doing that, Emotep. The only question becomes sisters and brothers. In this critical moment in history, where will we stand? Where will be our latest multi-genius? What will be our latest edifice of pyramidical uh, uh, possibilities in terms of us moving forward? But if we know from whence we've come, if we know the genes that we have, we know on whose shoulders we stand, we know that we are an African people and that together, Ujima, collective work and respect, together we will win. Sisters and brothers, I thank you for having listened to this discussion. We thank again Dr. Clyde, Ro uh, uh, Clyde Robinson for this opportunity, and we hope to see you down the road of peace. Don't forget get to go to the website, ibw21.org, to catch up with what the Institute of the Black World 21st Century is doing and the National African American Reparations Commission. Brother Ron Daniels, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Reparations is a reality that we must all pursue with a gusto and with fervor. I'd like to recognize and thank the following Southern University personnel. Interim Chancellor at Southern University at New Orleans, Dr. James Amons. Dr. Brenda Jackson, Vice Chancellor for Research and Strategic Initiatives and Executive Director for the Title III programs. Dr. Evelyn Horrell, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Again, I'd like to say Asante Sana to Ms. Linda Hill, who is the archivist and curator for the Center for African and African American Studies, as well as Ms. Darlene Holmes, who's the secretary and office manager. Finally, Dr. Michael H. Meehan, who is the director of satellite communications, and Mr. Chauncey Kamen, who is the Southern University at New Orleans webmaster. Abaragani, celebrate its Kwanzaa time.